Gospels tonight. We'd open them to Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. Luke chapter 16, beginning at verse 19. One of the most controversial... Hold on a second. Luke chapter 16. And, uh, this is a very controversial portion of Scripture, but I'm hoping that for the end of the night we'll have the controversy ended and we'll understand, in fact, what the Lord was saying and how he was saying it. And uh, there are a lot of people in the world today. Here you go. Beginning in verse 19. Luke 16, we're standing in honor of the reading of God's word, and the word of the Lord reads, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And he in, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, and being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. I just want to talk for a little while today on the topic of, Had I known then what I know now? Had I known then? Master, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you, Lord, for an opportunity to hear from your word, to receive from your spirit. We ask, God, that your anointing and your presence would rest upon your messenger. Help us, God, to deliver this word, which is so timely and so important and so imperative in this dark hour when there are so many who would seek to rewrite and retranslate the word of God to make it say things that are more comfortable for people to hear. But, Master, help us today rather to understand what indeed you are saying in truth, not what we want to hear, Lord, but what we need to hear. Help us to hear from your Spirit today. Open our ears, we pray, that we might receive, and loose the tongue of this preacher that I might proclaim. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated today. There's a lot of controversy on the topic of this particular portion of Scripture. There are certain groups of people which have gone to great lengths to try to write hell out of the Bible. And, of course, the most common, most notable group that we're aware of are the Jehovah's Witnesses. They've gone to great efforts to try to tell us that hell is a fiction, it is the creation of man, it is uh, the church's way of trying to manipulate and make the people afraid, and uh, that it does not in reality exist, that after you have died... Indeed, you're merely going to stand before God in the judgment and you will be annihilated, meaning you'll no longer exist. You'll, you'll simply be wiped off the face of the planet and you will no longer exist whatsoever. And this is a doctrine, certainly, that isn't altogether new. But it's interesting that in the Lord's day, as he was speaking to this audience this day, obviously hell was not a new concept to them. Obviously, they were not hearing about hell for the first time. 
because the way in which hell is represented to them, it is represented to them as a fact. It, it simply exists. The Lord said there were two people that lived. One was a rich man who will remain nameless. He said, however, there is a beggar whom I'm going to name, and that man's name is Lazarus. The Bible said the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Isn't it interesting that the rich man was a man of notoriety in life, but when the Lord spoke of him after his passing and after his demise, he chose to leave the rich man's name out, but he named Lazarus. Amen. Isn't that something? So the man who in life would have been the one unnamed was the man who in this story that the Lord chose to name, and the rich man who would have been the individual that everybody would have spoken of and named, the Lord chose to leave his name out of it. Now, according to the teaching of some organizations, this story is merely a parable. The Lord is just telling a parable. It's a story designed to teach a moral lesson or to teach some sort of a spiritual principle. However, we know today that that is not at all the truth. And how do we know that it is not true that in reality this story was the actual telling by the Lord of actual individuals who had lived and actual individuals who had experienced a very real experience? How do we know that? First of all, generally in a parable, the writer acknowledges that the Lord was speaking by reason of a parable. If you look through the biblical writings, if you look at the writings of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the Gospels, most often they would say, and then he spake to them in a parable saying. It does not say that here. There is no indication that he's speaking in a parable. There is no specific reference that states clearly he is speaking in a parable, whereas in most other instances there is some specific indication that the Lord is speaking in a parable. Secondly, never in a parable, listen to this now, were historic characters mentioned by name. Are you hearing me now? The Lord spoke of Abraham. Abraham played a role in this parable. Nowhere in any other parable is any historic reference ever made to a historic character. The characters in, par in parables are generally nameless and faceless. A certain man had two sons. One was a good son. One was a bad son. You see what I'm saying? Parables generally are without names, without faces. There are no references to individual characters. Certainly no references are made uh, to any of uh, historic characters that might be involved in the telling of the tale. Also, never in parables do the characters have names. When the Lord used parables, he never gave the characters names. Never one time. Not one single time. Therefore, for the Lord to say there was a certain rich man, and there was a beggar named Lazarus, immediately, by reason of the Lord's doing this, he's making it very clear that I am not telling you a parable. I am telling you a story of two actual individuals who existed. Because in a parable, he would not have given names to any of the characters. The Lord never did it. Why would he all of a sudden do it once out of all of history? He's going to suddenly, out of the clear blue, he's going to give a name to one of the characters in the parable. A parable uses an earthly example to illustrate a, dis a divine principle. Well, let me ask you a question. Having read this story tonight, and I'm sure many of you have looked at this story many, many times over, what divine principle is being illustrated in the story of Lazarus and the rich man? There is no divine principle because it's not a parable. It's not trying to teach a divine principle. What it's actually doing is it is showing the fate of the godly versus the ungodly, the sinner versus the saint. It is showing the difference in uh, eternity that exists for those that walk in obedience and those that walk in disobedience. There is no divine principle. You cannot point 
I can point to every single parable that Jesus ever taught with, every single one of them, and I can tell you in a nutshell what he was illustrating by reason of that, by reason of that parable. For instance, if I said to you, the sower and the seed, what is, what is the divine principle relative to the sower and the seed? Well, the principle is this. Just like when you plant seed, it depends upon where that seed falls as to how well it's going to grow or not. And the Word of God is the same thing. If it falls on somebody who's hard-hearted and doesn't want to believe, it's not going to grow. If it falls upon somebody who's not necessarily hard-hearted, but they're not altogether receptive, then before too long, the enemy's going to come and steal away the Word that God has tried to plant in their heart before they have a chance to really grab hold of it. Or there's the opportunity for thorns and thistles to grow up and to choke out that which God has planted. But then there are those whose hearts are good and are receptive and the Word of God is immediately able to spring forth fruit in their lives. Okay, so the divine principle of the sower and the seed, we can easily uh, articulate that. We can throw it right out there and tell you, well, the Lord was comparing the sowing of the Word of God into the hearts and lives of individuals to the sowing of seed like a farmer would do. And the different conditions and how the seed is received or not received depending upon the conditions uh, that, uh, that surround its being sown. So therefore, in a parable, there's always a divine principle that you can immediately pull out of it. But in the tale of Lazarus and the rich man, there is no divine principle here. Because this is not a parable, it is a historic telling. What does that mean? That means the Lord is speaking in fact. Factually, there was a rich man. Factually, there was a man named Lazarus. That doesn't mean that I created a fictitious character named Lazarus. It means that there literally was a man whose name was Lazarus. A parable, in a parable, the biblical writers generally acknowledged that the Lord was teaching by reason of a parable, by saying, and the Lord spake in a parable saying, or something to that effect. Never in a parable are historic characters mentioned by name, like Abraham in this story. Never in a parable do the characters have names. They're always nameless and faceless. Certain man had two sons. One son said, yes, I'll do it, but he didn't. The other son said, I don't want to do it, but he did. Which of those two sons is the better son? Well, the one that did. What is the divine principle in that? Well, it's easy. It's not what you say, it's what you do. So you see, the principle, immediately you can extract the divine principle from a parable. Immediately you can extract the principle. But if you look at the story of Lazarus and the rich man, there is no principle to be expected because the Lord is not trying to use it as a teaching tool relative to some divine principle. In fact, what the Lord ultimately, the conclusion that the Lord ultimately is able to make using this story is simply this one fact. This is why he used this story, and this is not a divine principle, this is just a fact. He, basically, the Lord was teaching them, if people don't want to believe this gospel, mother, it doesn't matter if the dead are raised and walk up to them and say, hey, let me tell you, I've been to the other side, I've been on the other, uh, I've been on the other side of death, there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun, they still won't believe. Now, why would the Lord say that? Why would he make that point? It's very simple. Because he was the first to rise from the dead, and he said, therefore, if they won't believe Abraham and the prophets, he said, then even if one rise from the dead, they won't believe, meaning himself. He was speaking of himself. But there was no divine principle. There was no, uh, there was, this was not a matter of simply telling a tale in order to get a point across, you might say. Okay? If you look at, the story in Matthew 21, 28, and this is another way that the Lord frequently would begin a parable. He would begin by posing a question, but what think ye? But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And you know the rest of the story, right? One son said, okay, I'll go, but he didn't. The other son said, no, I don't want to go, but he did. 
But the Lord began the parable with, what say ye? In other words, draw a conclusion from this. What conclusion do you draw from what I'm about to say to you? But he didn't say that prior to Lazarus and the rich man. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 1, the Lord said, uh, the, the Mark writes, and he began to speak unto them by parables. So Mark makes it perfectly clear right here and then that what you're about to hear is being delivered in parable fashion. A certain man planted a vineyard and sent a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and lent it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. Again, never do any of the characters have names. He never names the characters because this is a parable. This is only given in an effort to help establish a divine principle. Okay? If you look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 16, again the word of the Lord declares, And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. If you look at Luke chapter 13 and verse 6, he says, He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereof and found none. Do you see that? Do you follow where I'm going with this? Do you see what I'm trying to illustrate? When the Lord spoke in parables, the gospel writers made it very clear that he was speaking in parables. They made it very, they made it very poignantly clear that here the Lord spoke to them in a parable. But he didn't do that with the story of Lazarus and the rich man. In Luke chapter 15, 11, and he said, a certain man had two sons. Again, no names are given in this story. It doesn't say a certain man had two sons, and one of the sons' names was Joe, and one of the sons' names was Fred. No, because in a parable, names are arbitrary. They mean nothing. They really have no value. It's kind of like going to school. You remember when you used to go to school and take tests, especially in math? And they'd give you these word tests, you know. Eighty-five people got on five train cars and were riding at 55 miles an hour, leaving, uh, you know, East Texas to go to West Texas. And at the same time, 106 people got on 16 train cars riding at 75 miles an hour from West Texas. And now tell us, what time will they meet in Odessa? Well, the fact of the business is, a lot of times what they would do in these word questions when we were kids, they would give us information that was entirely unnecessary. It didn't have anything to do with the equation. And part of what your job as a student was, was to determine how much of that information do I need and what part of that information do I not need. Does it really matter how many people were on the cars? if I'm determining what time the trains are going to get to their destination. No, it doesn't matter how many people go on the train. That's information that's unnecessary. Therefore, in the telling of a parable, the Lord never gave unnecessary information because that would have clouded the story and it would have made the principle harder to extract. And he wasn't trying to make it hard. He was trying to make it easy. That's the point of a, of a parable was to help make the principle easier to grasp. So therefore, he always avoided giving unnecessary information. Why then, if the story of Lazarus and the rich man is a parable, why then did he give us a name which is completely unnecessary, has nothing to do with nothing? Because it was not a parable. If you look at Luke chapter 16 and verse 1, the Bible says, And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. Again, he doesn't name the steward. He doesn't name the rich man. He said there's a certain rich man, there's a steward. Period. Case closed. That's all the Lord ever gave in the telling of a parable. A parable only used geographic or physical locations when doing so enhanced the lesson to be learned by that detail. Now, did you hear that? In the story of Lazarus and the rich man, we read two things. We read, number one, we read that Lazarus dies and is carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. So we're being told of a location where Lazarus went after death. 
But the Bible doesn't stop there. It said also the rich man died. And here's what's interesting. Look at how they word what happens to the rich man. And was buried. Making it poignant. It doesn't say that Lazarus was buried. Because when a saint of God dies, everything that happens to that body in the middle, all the burial and all the ritual and all the funeral, that's all arbitrary to God because in reality, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So therefore, they didn't even waste their time talking about what happened to his body because in truth, as a believer, when we die, we're going to be carried by the angels into the presence of the Lord. Thank God. So it tells us, Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into the presence of the Lord. It doesn't say anything about him being buried. But it does tell us that the rich man died and was buried. For all his wealth, for all of his influence, for all of his opulent lifestyle, all of a sudden, guess what? He became part of the earth, honey. In the end, he became part of the, uh, the process of life. The circle of life, as they like to say. But at the same time, it goes on then to tell us that even though the rich man was buried, and according to some doctrines, he would be buried in a place called hell, because that's what they try to tell you, is that hell is the grave. But even though the Bible tells us the rich man's body was buried, it then goes on to tell us, but he being in hell, lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Not only are we now told of a location for the rich man, but we're also being told of the experience of the rich man. He's in torments. So therefore, the rich man is capable of experiencing emotion. He's capable of experiencing pain. He's capable of experiencing all of the sensations of human life. However, he is no longer married to his body. He is separated from his body. But the Bible tells us his soul was in hell. In this parable, we're given two locations, Abraham's bosom and hell. Bear in mind that this story was told prior to the crucifixion. I get so sick and tired of people trying to put the man on the cross that Jesus said, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. I get so tired of people trying to put that man in heaven with Jesus. He could not get to heaven. He could not be in heaven with the Lord that day. The Lord wasn't even going to be in heaven that day. But you go to a Baptist church and they'll tell you that man was converted on the cross and he was saved on the cross. That's a lie. He was not saved on the cross. He couldn't possibly be saved on the cross because if he was saved on the cross, that means he was saved without the benefit of the resurrection. And I've got news for you. None of us can be saved without the benefit of the resurrection. Nobody can be saved without the benefit of the resurrection. So therefore, the notion that the thief was converted and saved on the cross is a foolish notion. In reality, Jesus was saying to the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, meaning Sheol, which spoke of a place, or excuse me, I'm sorry, Haiti, which spoke of a place of holding, a place of waiting. Because historically the Jewish people had taught that when you died, everybody stood before God guilty. Everybody stood before the Lord sinful. And therefore everybody had to go to hell. But the difference was in their teaching that as a good Jew who had embraced the law and who had awaited the arrival of Messiah, in their teaching, there was a separate portion of hell known as Haiti, where Hades, where the faithful were held and where they were kept. And this particular area was commonly referred to as Abraham's bosom. 
So they weren't in heaven with the Father. They were still separated from God, and they were in hell. But the difference is, they were not condemned to stay there. They were merely waiting. They were holding until Messiah arrived. Which is why the Bible tells us that when the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, the Bible said he, de whoo, glory, he descended into Hades, and he led captivity captive. He literally loosed them from their place of waiting because they'd been waiting for Messiah the whole time. And after the Lord died, he went and preached unto them which were, the Bible says, in hell. He said, I'm here. And there was old headless John. <laughs> there was old headless John. He said, I died just a little while before he got here. He said, but Lord, let me tell you, as soon as I arrived in this place of waiting, I let them know that you were coming. I let them know that we wouldn't be here long. I let them know that it was almost time for captivity to be led out of this place. And we were about to be set free because the footsteps of Messiah are walking the face of planet Earth right this very moment. And when the Lord died on the cross of Calvary, he had to make a trip to Haiti and say, folks, I'm here. I'm the one for whom you've been waiting. Amen. The Bible said at the resurrection, at the resurrection, many of the graves of them which slept also opened. The Lord was resurrected. Many of the great the thing that had slept also open. And you see, the reality is God had loosed Haiti. There was no longer a place of waiting within the parameters of or the boundaries of that place we call hell. But you see, Abraham's bosom, that place called Hades, which is frequently translated as hell because it was part of hell. It kind of be like saying Union City is part of Naugatuck. Or it'd be like saying that Oak Lawn is part of Dallas. Because Haiti was a part of hell. But the reality is today the Roman Catholic Church has tried to create the notion that Mike isn't working right. The Roman Catholic Church tries to create the notion that Hades still exists. They call it purgatory. You see, my friend, if you made the mistake of believing that hell is an invention of the Roman Catholic Church, I've got news for you. No, hell is something Jesus Christ himself validated in his own teaching. Hell is the reality. There's an old saying, hell's hot and heaven's real. There is valid biblical evidence that this is not a teaching that Roman Catholic Roman Catholicism invented. What Roman Catholicism invented is the doctrine that Hades still exists, now called purgatory, and that if you pay enough money and have enough prayer said and have enough masses said, you can get your soul out of purgatory at some point in the future. And as a money-making scheme and as a money-making device, the Roman Catholic Church came up with the notion that Hades is still in operation, but Hades no longer exists. There is no longer a holding pen or a holding cell within the mountains of hell where souls go and wait to be, to have their ransom paid, as it were, or to be uh, set free and loosed. There no longer exists a place of that nature. Now, in reality, when an individual goes to that place geographically, they are there for eternity. They're there to stay. If you look at the parable in Luke chapter 10, verse 30, and Jesus answering said, this is another way we knew the Lord often was speaking in a parable, because they would come to him with a question, and rather than answering the question, he would begin a story with unnamed characters, and he would just begin a certain man. And in this instance, the Bible said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. 
if this parable, in this parable, I'm sorry, the fact that the good Samaritan began his journey in Samaria was extremely important to the story, as it made clear that the one who did respond with compassion to the plight of the fallen Jew, how do we know he was a Jew? Because look where the man who fell among thieves began his journey, in Jerusalem. And he was going where? To Jericho. So you see, the Lord used geographic locations in this story. Why? It enhanced the story. This was not unnecessary information. These were not details that did not play a role in the telling of this story. Okay? This is not an instance where the Lord gave a bunch of information. To, who cares where the, the, the man who fell amongst thieves started? Who cares where the, the guy who uh, benefited him and helped him, who cares where he came from? It matters because the Lord was trying to illustrate that the very one who was the outcast himself, the very one who was looked down upon himself, because of where he came from, was the very one that showed compassion and mercy on the one who, when his own people, including a priest and a lawyer, came by, didn't even have time to try to help him. So therefore, the geographic detail in the story that I've just talked about, in this story of the Good Samaritan, the, the geographic details are necessary to that story because they help you to understand aspects of how people from that area are looked upon and how they're treated and how they're thought of. So only when the geographic location plays an important role in the telling of the parable are geographic locations used in a parable. But in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, the geographic locations that were given are not cities on earth, but rather we have Abraham's bosom, otherwise known as Haiti, and we have hell. And you'll notice the Bible says that when the rich man looked across and saw Lazarus and Abraham's bosom, that he began to speak to who? To Abraham, Father Abraham. He was a Jew. The rich man was a Jew. He, was a, he knew who Abraham was, and he began to address him. Father Abraham, could you do this for me? Just a touch of water because I'm thirsty. And Abraham's answer was, there is a chasm, there is a crevice, there is a, a canyon of sorts that separates where you are from where I am. You see, again, they were both in hell. But there was a division, there was a separation between where Abraham's bosom was and where this rich man was. This is one reason I say that I honestly, sincerely believe in what is referred to as degrees of punishment. Because if they can have one location where there are not torments, but rather there's comfort, and because Abraham, uh, the, the, excuse me, Lazarus was comforted in Abraham's bosom. So obviously in one part of hell there was actually comfort, whereas in another part of hell there was torments. In the story of Lazarus and the rich man, the Lord himself places the rich man in hell and Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Both men are clearly conscious, they're alert, and they are capable of feeling sensation. Hades and hell are said to be separated by a huge chasm, not by space, but by a crack or a crevice designed to divide. In the story of Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus is never given opportunity, listen, Lazarus is never given opportunity to respond to the cries of the man in hell. Read the story again. We just read it a few minutes ago. But rather, Abraham answers the cries of the man in hell. And he answers with absolute authority. We can't. It can't be done. Period. Case closed. End of story. Stop asking. You following me? Why in the world would God allow hell to be represented as a literal, physical place of torments, if indeed it did not exist. 
Why would God do that? The Lord Jesus Christ himself represented it to us in this story as a literal place of, that exists. Not as a place of death and annihilation, but as a place of torments. Even resurrection evidence is not enough to convince those committed to unbelief of the realities of both heaven and hell. The rich man said, send someone, send Lazarus to speak to my brothers and let them know. He said, no, even if someone rose from the dead, they still wouldn't believe it. Because even resurrection evidence is not enough. How many people have had what we call near-death experiences and come back and say, I, I, when I died, there was more. I don't care whether they even represent it as a Christian uh, concept or not. There was a great light, and I saw loved ones, and I saw this, and I saw that. How many people have heard these stories, and yet they still say, oh, when you die, you die. When you're gone, you're gone. I'll never answer to God. I'll never answer to anyone for the deeds I do in this life. Uh, you know, when you die, you're dead. How many people believe that way? And regardless of any evidence of resurrection whatsoever, they still continue to believe what they believe. That's what the Lord said would happen. He said it doesn't matter. Even if someone came back, they still believe what they believe. If you look at the story that we read tonight, in verse 24 it says, And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things? But now he is comforted. Remember I said, so in one portion of hell, he was actually still able to be comforted. He said, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Had the rich man known in life what he discovered after his death, he might have lived his life differently. If we do not embrace by faith the realities of a living God today, a God who shall one day sit in judgment of all of us who have lived in this life, then we shall be doomed to repeat throughout eternity, if I had known then what I know now. If I had known then what I know now. Hebrews 11 and 6 declares, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must first believe that he is. And you've heard me say it so many times. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you're going to find God, you don't approach him saying, Well, I believe God exists, and I believe he'll punish me if I do wrong, wrong. That's not what Paul said in Hebrews 11. He said, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Therefore, if you're going to find God, first you've got to believe that he is, and secondly, you've got to believe that he is a rewarder, not a punisher. So a preacher who preaches hell as a means of scaring people into eternity is doing a disservice to people because you cannot find God through fear. You can only find God through faith. It is not God's desire that we believe he exists and that he is a punisher of those who do wrong, but rather it is his wish that we recognize that he exists and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him passionately. Many GLBT people who have allowed themselves to be pushed out of God's church by judgmental people devoid of understanding and divine revelation will spend eternity saying, if I had known then. Because all of a sudden, you know, one of the things that torments us in hell, one of the things that will torment millions in hell throughout eternity is you're not, you, you can't claim ignorance anymore because you're going to know it all. 
you're going to know it all. All of a sudden, you're going to look back and say, you know what? I was deceived by that organization. They convinced me to believe a lie. They convinced me to believe a doctrine that was false. And they convinced me to believe teaching that was wrong. And But you know what? All of a sudden, people say, but it wouldn't be, God wouldn't be a God of justice if he allowed people. Oh, but you know what, sweetheart? You're going to be sitting there in hell knowing good and darn well. But you know what? I bought into it because I wanted to. I bought in it because I wanted to. I bought in it because I had something against the church I grew up in. I bought in it because I had something against this one or that one or the way my mother raised me or this or that. And all of a sudden, you're going to realize every single factor that, that played a part in every single decision you ever made is going to be known to you. And you're not going to be able to hide from it anymore. And you're going to have people sitting there, oh, if I had known then. What I know now, if I had known then, if I had known that I could not allow my disdain for the way that some preachers fleece the flock of God and make money off of God's people and allow that to push me into the arms of a false doctrine and a false teaching. Because the reality is, well, there's, there might be hundreds, even thousands, whatever, that, that do use the ministry for those reasons. You know what? There's also hundreds of thousands that don't. I've known many of them throughout my life. I've known many preachers throughout my life who lived their entire lives and never had a whole lot of nothing, but they were faithful in the pulpit week after week, month after month, year after year. One man that I always think of is Madeline Obar's dad. Do you remember him? This man was a minister, and he went to a community to start a church, and he wound up spending his entire life in that one little church. And you know what, Tommy? He never got more than a dozen people, I don't think, the entire time he was there. He tried, and he tried, and he tried for year after year after year. But that man was faithful, faithful to the end. He continued. He did what he felt that God had placed him there to do. And the few people that were in this church, he fed them every Sunday. And you know what? He never did become rich. He never did become well-known. He never did become a television personality. But he did what he did because he had conviction and he believed in what he was doing. And I've got news for you. I know hundreds of preachers who every Sunday, black preachers, white preachers, I know many who get up every Sunday in churches that don't have a lot of people, that don't have a lot of money, and they're not there. It is not a money-making scheme for them. It is a matter of conviction. They love God. They love their calling. They love a God. God's called them to do, and by God, they're going to do what God's called them to do, whether there be few or many, whether there be a lot or a little, whether there be money or no money. But if we allow some organization to come along and tell us, well, you know what, all religion is about is money. All everybody's after is money. That's all they're all. And, and then you're going to let that organization convince you that their false teaching and their false doctrines are fact, and they're using that lie to begin with, to deceive you, guess what, sweetie? When you get to hell, you're going to be looking up and saying, you know what? All of a sudden now, I see things I didn't see then. All of a sudden now, you know what? Now I remember that preacher used to live down the street from me. All of a sudden now, I remember that he, bless his heart, never one time did that man drive around in a Cadillac. Never one time did that man have a new car. Never one time did I see that man in a zoot suit or a fancy outfit or a diamond ring. Never one time. And, oh, but in this life, you were willing to believe a lie because at the moment it suited you. And then we're going to look back and say, oh, if I had known then... There's going to be a lot of people. This preacher's been trying to tell people in the GLBT community for years now that God understands you. God knows you. He made you. He created you. There's not an aspect of you that God doesn't get. And as you can see tonight, there aren't millions of people just flooding into our church in order to hear this message. But you know what? One day, Tommy, they're going to be sitting in hell saying, if I had known then. Because they're going to give it. It may be too late by the time they get it, but they're going to get it. And there's a lot of us that sit here today, and we take chances with eternity because there are so many things that you could understand now if you wanted to. Don't tell me Jerry Falwell couldn't get it if he wanted to. 
Don't tell me Pat Robertson couldn't get it if he wanted to. These men could easily get it if they wanted to. The problem is, it's easier to be hateful. It's easier to be judgmental. It's easier to choose how you want your faith to manifest itself rather than letting God speak to you and say, no, this is how I want you.